Hi everyone, we're back to the doldrums, and if you remember from last reading, Oliver was the last one behind, left behind, because Archer and Adelaide had already gone ahead like they had planned. But who caught Oliver? Mrs. Merkley. So let's start where we um, left off. Archer and Adelaide were still next to capping. They were next to tapping cues. Archer was growing worried. He should have been here by now, he replied. I'm sure he's on his way, Adelaide replied. They stepped away from the sarcophagus and searched a corridor, hoping to see Oliver or a gazelle, and they didn't. But they turned back just in time to see Mrs. Merkley march into the room. Something's happened, said Archer. To Oliver, said Adelaide. We have to go. Archer grabbed her hand, and they ran from the Egyptian wing and ducked into the hall. In his rush, Archer didn't notice the jade elephant house fall from his bag. A janitor watched this happen. He picked it up and slipped it into his jumpsuit pocket and was about to go after them when the museum director, who was making his rounds, quickly jumped in front of him. Are you stealing from the museum? the director asked. I wasn't, said the janitor. It's only... The director reached into the janitor's pocket and removed the jade figurine. I see. He signaled for the two security guards and said, take him to pack his things. The guards nodded, each took one of his arms. But it doesn't belong to the museum, said the janitor. It's not. It's the Thai ferry. Archer and Adelaide were hiding behind a mountain goat when Mrs. Merkley stormed into the hall. Her eyes were hopping everywhere, but she didn't see them behind the pedestal. She continued across the room, but when she reached the end, she stopped. Why isn't she leaving, whispered Adelaide. I think she smells us, said Archer. Two guards entered the hall, carrying the janitor roughly by the arms, and they dragged him through a door marked museum personnel only. Quick, whispered Archer. They crept behind a moose and slipped through the door before it closed. The guards were going down a spiraling stairway. Archer and Adelaide went up. They went up and up and up and pushed through a small door at the end of a museum tower. The wind blew the masks from their heads and carried them deep into Rosewood Park. They ran full circle around the spire. There was nowhere else to go. I don't think we should go back that way, said Archer, pointing to the door. She still might be there. He squinted far across the roof to where a second tower rose. Do you think we can get over there? Adelaide wasn't, wasn't sure, but she nodded. So Archer carefully helped her over the wall and then lowered himself to the roof. For a moment, neither of them moved. They were standing on a moldy strip of slate, only two feet wide. The roof slanted steeply down on both sides. A slip from here would send them plummeting four stories. This wasn't a good idea, said Archer. We just have to be careful, said Adelaide. They joined hands and with great care began inching their way through the wind across the roof. Mr. Helmsley was in his office. His secretary was seated across from him taking notes. Are those children on the museum rooftop? His secretary asked, pointing over his head and out the window. Mr. Helmsley spun around and peered out the window. He removed his glasses, cleaned them against his shirt, and squinted once more. Sure enough, two figures were making their way across the rooftop. One figure slipped. The other helped it up. Both continued on. They're going to get themselves killed. They almost look like... Mr. Helmsley spun around. He asked his secretary to leave and picked up the phone. Is something wrong? Mrs. Helmsley asked. I'm not sure, said Mr. Helmsley. I just want to know if Archer was at home. Yes, she replied. He's reading in his room. Can you check? Mrs. Helmsley set the phone down and went to Archer's room. There was a lump in the bed. She approached the lump and placed her hand on it. What should have been Archer's shoulder, it wasn't. He's a badger, she yelled into the phone. He's a what? asked Mr. Helmsley. Archer and Adelaide reached the opposite spire and took shelter from the wind in an arched alcove. They could see out across Rosewood Park. The shaggy trees gave way to the warehouses of Barrows Bay and the canal. Beyond that, they could just make out Rosewood Port in a glittering silver streak that was the sea. That's where they wanted to be. Glittering specks on the glittering sea. And that would be simple if only they could sprout wings and fly from the roof, but they couldn't. So they stood with their backs pressed tight against the tower, watching as leaves swirled in the wind. At least she won't look up here, said Adelaide. 
Neither will Oliver, Archie replied. Four stories below, an anxious Oliver was sitting in a special exhibit space. The room was like a greenhouse. It extended beyond the museum and into the Rosewood Park, which loomed just beyond the raw iron and glass walls. Oliver's eyes were fixed out those windows, hoping Adelaide and Archer weren't running through the park without him. The other students were staring at the center of the room, where a large wooden platform held a cage with three tigers that were staring straight back at the students. How tasty, thought one. Except for that string bean, thought the second. He's too lean and, have, and won't have much flavor. He'd made a good toothpick, thought the third, to pry the chunks of that graceful swan-like one from our teeth. A glass door opened at the far end of the exhibit space, and a man with a dolly wheeled a container toward the cage. Two more men lifted the container, while a fourth opened it. Inside were all sorts of meat. Everyone leaned forward, everyone except Oliver. Oliver bent down and dug into his bag. He decided to make a run for it. One of the zoo workers unlatched the cage. Oliver stood up and secured his gazelle mask. Archer and Adelaide climbed down the tower and popped into the museum, but before Archer had even taken two steps, two massive hands clamped around his shoulders and squeezed tight. It was Mrs. Merkley. He couldn't believe it. And what do you think you're doing, she demanded, eyes blazing. Let him go, said Adelaide. You're going to ruin everything. Ruin what everything? We have to go, said Archer. Go where, she barked. It's none of your business, said Adelaide. I'm your teacher, growled Mrs. Merkley. Everything is my business, and the only place you two are going is back to my office. Mrs. Merkley swung a hand at Adelaide, but she spun a lopsided pirouette. She tripped over her wooden leg and crashed into a pedestal hosting a massive polar bear. The bear wobbled back and forth, and Mrs. Merkley moved in to grab Adelaide. You can't know the joy I will take in stuffing the two of you into... <gasps> Look out, someone shouted. It's going to fall, yelled someone else. The polar bear leaned forward. Mrs. Merkley leaned backward. She released Archer and threw up her hands. Archer jumped. Mrs. Merkley didn't. But she let out a shriek when the polar bear began its journey south straight into her outstretched arms. It was a formidable match, but Mrs. Markley was defeated, smashed to the floor beneath the massive polar bear. Audra lifted Adelaide up off the ground. A crowd swooped in on the scene. Everyone stared at the tangled mass of Merkley and polar bear. I think she's dead. I've never seen a dead person before. It can't look much different. Should we roll it off of her? There's the polar bear. The crowd agreed that they would be more sensible, so a handful of strangers rolled the creature off the woman. Mrs. Merkley had gone completely white in the face. The crowd waited in silence, and then very slowly, two tiny slits opened to her eyes. She's alive! A solid woman, that is. They don't make them like that anymore. Mrs. Merkley lifted her head and scanned the surrounding... Um, crowd, passing from one person to the next till she found the two she was searching for. Archer and Adelaide remained silent. Mrs. Merkley let out a groan and mumbled, Criminals! That's what you are! Only it didn't sound like that at all. The crowd, le the crowd leaned forward. What did she say? I think she said criminal rats cut blue jars. What does that mean? It means she's been knocked senseless. Her screws are loose. They do still make them like that. Mrs. Merkley lowered her head to the ground and the polar bear was next to her, but no one seemed concerned about it. What are you waiting for? The bear whispered to Archer. Run! Archer nodded. He took one last look at Mrs. Merkley before pulling Adelaide through the crowd. We have to go now or we're never going to make it, he whispered. This is becoming a nightmare. They ran back to the gaudy little fellow, hoping Oliver would be waiting for them. And I will end... There. It's a very long chapter, so we have to do it in pieces. Till next time.